from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. I hope your new year is off to a great start as we all try to get back to normal after the holiday season. It was no different here in state government where the news week started slow but quickly picked up steam here into the weekend. 2024 will certainly bring new beginnings, but it starts with some old problems lingering for Alabama's prison system and the medical marijuana industry. We'll start with medical marijuana. A Montgomery judge has again blocked the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission from issuing licenses. Montgomery Judge James Anderson this week issued a temporary restraining order stopping the commission from awarding licenses for integrated medical marijuana vendors. Those are the companies that handle all phases of the cannabis product from seed to sale. And they're some of the most sought after licenses. Companies that were not selected for these licenses filed suit, claiming the process was unfair. The block is only temporary as the case is heard in court. Commission Director John McMillan said, quote, we remain determined and hopeful that the availability of medical cannabis products recommended by certified physicians to qualified Alabama patients is right around the corner. Now to prisons, where there was another tragic death at an Alabama correctional facility. Clifton Adam Bond was found dead in his cell Thursday at St. Clair Correctional Facility near Birmingham. The death came just days after Bond expressed fears to his family about being in imminent danger, fears that his family passed on to the Alabama Department of Corrections. His family last month attended a legislative prison oversight meeting and pleaded with lawmakers to address the violent conditions in Alabama prisons. Bond was serving a 20-year sentence for first-degree robbery and burglary. The Department of Corrections said its Law Enforcement Services Division is investigating, investigating Bond's death, the cause of which is pending an autopsy. Frustrations over the prison situation spilled out again this week at a meeting of the Joint Legislative Contract Review Committee. When a legal contract for the Department of Corrections came up for review, State Representative Chris England told the department attorney that he has been sent cell phone videos and pictures taken by inmates showing extreme violence. He wants the department to be more proactive and transparent on the issue. You know, and, and I've, again, I've seen a million pictures and a million videos. You know what I've never seen in any of them? Anybody from the Department of Corrections, not a guard or anything. Um, so I'm pretty sure because every time I, I every time I ask or or call, th there's always an answer. But over the course of the last few months. Um, some of the things, some of the answers that I've received and talking to some of the families, these, these, something, these things aren't adding up. So um, I, we need a little bit more responsiveness, more transparency, some assistance from the Department of Corrections so uh, we can assure these families that, you know, if somebody's, one of their loved ones is incarcerated and they're being abused, mm -hmm. extorted, abused by COs, nor, I mean, I got a video of several overdoses. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it is it is getting out of control. There are two sides to every story, and the DOC, you know, for every email you have, I'm sure we have information for that. I appreciate your concern, and I will absolutely pass along all this information to. I'll speak to the commissioner myself today and make sure he understands your concerns. After the meeting, England said he would consider holding up routine contracts if only to get the department's attention. Similar, he said, to what U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville did with military promotions on the abortion issue. For I guess three or four years now, maybe longer, actually, been kind of tilting at windmills um, as the condition, conditions within the facilities are getting worse. And what's interesting is after lawsuits, investigations, charges, videos, all this evidence is coming forth, uh, since the, we've gotten the federal courts involved, we've likely gotten worse. So um, I don't know necessarily what it's going to take to get their attention, to make sure that they're responding to people, to make sure that our, pardon, I mean, our parole system actually starts functioning. Um, but you know, it's at a point now where 
you got to do whatever it takes in order to at least get their attention so they can respond. State Representative Chris Pringle spoke out to say the real problem is the prevalence of cell phones in prisons. He said inmates' ability to communicate with the outside world allows them to threaten and extort other inmates and corrections officers. The federal government will now allow us to block cell signals in our prisons. So the, the prisoners, they, they get cell phones brought in and that's how they run their criminal enterprises. They're allowed to communicate with their gang members or their, their fellow criminals outside the, the, the prison walls and they, they can use that, that technology if it, say a new guard comes into the prison, they, they find out everything they can about that guard. They find out about his children or their children. They find out about any type of financial problems and they use that against the guards to force them into a situation where they're smuggling contraband into our prisons. They are very well organized. They are, they've got nothing but time on their hands to sit in those prisons and use those cell phones to run criminal enterprises. And the government will not let us to block it. And it's, a, it's one of the bigger problems of why we have the problems we have. There's only one month to go before the 2024 legislative session begins. This year's session is shaping up to be a busy one. And it always starts with the budgets. The primary responsibility of the legislature is to pass the general fund, which pays for non-education agencies, and the education trust fund, which pays for the range of school spending from pre-K to higher ed. The latest revenue numbers on the education side show a slight dip in revenue compared to last fiscal year. For December, revenue was down 2.57 percent compared to the same month the previous year. For the first three months of fiscal, 24, fiscal year 2024, revenue was down just 1.19 percent. Budget experts say that is nothing to be concerned about and it's actually expected considered the record growth the state saw last year, thanks in part to federal relief dollars in the tax base. It could, however, impact the grocery sales tax. You'll remember that lawmakers reduced that 4% tax on groceries by one cent last session. And it will go down by another cent in 2025 if revenue growth is strong enough to support it. For the general fund, there's even better news. Last fiscal year ended with a 16% increase, and so far this year, revenues are outpacing the previous year. State Representative Rex Reynolds, who chairs the House General Fund Budget Committee, said that's thanks to high interest rates on bonds and the continued growth in the online sales tax. Well, they are very strong here Here now, two, two budget cycles in a row, very strong general fund growth. Uh, obviously, as we've talked about before, uh, a huge percentage of that, over 119 percent was interest on state deposits on the accounts. Uh, the other growth is being seen in uh, SSUT uh, and ad valorem taxes, and that's where we're seeing the, the three primary areas we're seeing growth. Now, we only saw like a 1.19 percent uh, increase in December, 23 over 22 numbers, but we had, a, we had a deposit of opioid settlement funds in 22, which is offsetting that. So if you take that and add it to the $3.3 million growth uh, that we saw just saw in, the, in yesterday's receipts, you know, that's putting us up over almost $30 million over in December. So strong numbers, a lot of one-time money, uh, as you know, based on the wording that we put in the contingency line item last year, the first $100 million of, of the uh, uh, budget will go into prisons. Uh, from last year's supplemental, or this, yeah, 2023 supplemental. There has been a changing of the guard, literally. Governor Kay Ivey on Friday presided over the changing command ceremony for Brigadier General David Pritchett, the new Adjutant General of the Alabama National Guard. General Pritchett replaces Major General Cheryl Gordon, who is retiring. You know, it's, it's very humbling. Um, but our family, we're honored to come back to Alabama. Uh, I spent uh, almost 30 years in the Alabama National Guard before, uh, before I left uh, to Fort Sill for three years on a Title X tour, active duty, and then on up to the Wyoming National Guard for the past two and a half years. Um, so all of our family's here. So getting to come back here uh, to the grandkids and our own family, uh, my mom, uh, my, my wife's family. Uh, today is really a Today is really about the outgoing tag and celebrating her 43-year career. Um, 
but but again, we're honored to uh, to replace her. She's she's done tremendous things for for Alabama, and it'll be tough boots to fill, but we're going to do our best. So, thank you. I want to thank everyone for being here on this special day. I know that I have been truly blessed throughout my life, more than I deserve. I thank God for the goodness that he has given me. It has been my goal to be a servant leader in this organization and inspire others to be the same. To the airmen, soldiers, civilians of the Alabama National Guard, I ask you to continue to serve with the same measure of professionalism and honor that has made you successful. Continue to set the standard for the quality of your work and show the world what it means to be servant leaders. Continue to grow the positive trends we are on today and treat everyone with respect and as a valued member of the organization. Thank you for who you are and what you do, all of you. Governor Ivey, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this family. It has been an honor and a privilege. And General Pritchett, take care of our family. Thank you. Turning now to the congressional delegation, 4th District Congressman Robert Adderholt was one of dozens of House Republicans who traveled to the southern border this week. Their goal was to call the nation's attention to the immigration crisis happening at the border and to call on the Biden administration to do more to stem the illegal flow of migrants into the United States. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, as many as 10,000 migrants a day were arrested at the border in December. Adderholt witnessed the situation right there in person. I'm at the, at the Mexican uh, U.S. border, uh, Eagle Pass, Texas, and you can see uh, illegal immigrants that are trying to get across. Uh, this is, happens on a daily occurrence. Shows more than ever that in Washington we have to get a handle on this. The Biden administration must uh, do their work and make sure that uh, we secure borders. Another accolade for Alabama's port. A new analysis published by Forbes ranked the Port of Mobile as the second fastest growing port in the country. What's even more impressive about this ranking is that it includes not just seaports, but also international airports and border crossings. Alabama's port grew by 122 percent over the last 10 years. That's second only to Corpus Christi, Texas, which Forbes called an energy powerhouse. Behind the Port of Mobile on the list were Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport and Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. It seems like everyone has come down with something over the last month or two. If you're like me and haven't gotten sick, count yourself lucky and knock on wood. Part of what's going around are respiratory illnesses that can be severe. As Capitol Journal's Randy Scott reports, state health officials are monitoring the situation closely to see just how serious it gets. The last couple of years, we've seen some unusual activity due to COVID-19 and the effect of sort of the lingering effects of the pandemic, but we're falling into more seasonal patterns now. Dr. Wes Stubblefield is the medical officer with the Alabama Department of Public Health. His agency monitors diseases affecting Alabamians. At the top of that list, respiratory illnesses. We have seen uh, emergency department visits and hospitalizations related to COVID-19 and influenza that have increased week over week um, over the past month or, or month and a half. Um, we are also seeing some RSV activity Stubblefield says Alabama joins the rest of the nation watching those patterns. These respiratory viruses, you know, they can start in certain parts of the country and then move to other parts. If you look at influenza, for example, um, the southeast is overrepresented um, and the upper Midwest is underrepresented in terms of activity. It's a new year and a new season for respiratory illnesses. According to the Alabama Department of Public Health, right now is a prime time for respiratory problems to rise. That's why the department is doing what it can to help citizens stay safe and fight those problems. We try to get information out. Uh, we have information out on news releases. Um, 
We have information, of course, on our website, including uh, respiratory disease trackers that uh, the public can see at alabamapublichealth.gov. Stubblefield says information about these illnesses are very valuable tools. They're all very different. Um, for COVID-19 and flu, we have a broad, broadly available vaccine. With RSV, we have very targeted vaccines for only for certain groups, those that are very young and, very, uh, and among the um, older individuals. He adds some good news is treatment is available. They're all very different. Um, for COVID-19 and flu, we have a broad, broadly available vaccine. With RSV, we have very targeted vaccines for only for certain groups, those that are very young and, very, uh, and among the um, older individuals. And if you believe you're sick, see medical professionals. So there are advantages to getting the um, to getting tested for these viruses. Uh, they, they, like I said, the symptoms can overlap. It can be very difficult to tell the difference between COVID-19, uh, influenza, and RSV uh, just in general. But there are, are tests available for all three of these that are widely available. To make sure citizens stay healthy. COVID-19 and influenza can be treated, um, especially if it's early on in the course, and may be able to uh, reduce the length or the severity of the illness. For, for influenza, this includes most anyone with the, with the disease. And for those with COVID-19, it, it, it is limited to certain high-risk individuals. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. Coming up after the break, I'll interview two more candidates for Congress in the newly redrawn 2nd Congressional District, current State Senator Marika Coleman and former state senator Dick Brubaker. And later in the show, a special treat for us history buffs. State Representative Tracy Estes and local historian Joel Mize join me to discuss the historic Old Byler Road project that could become the state's newest tourist attraction. You won't want to miss that. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Joining me next is State Senator Marika Coleman, Democratic candidate for Congress in Alabama's 2nd District. Senator, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Like I said, we're trying to get to all candidates yeah, in this race. Sure. It's going to be tough because there's a lot of them, <laughs> but I appreciate you coming on. I know y'all have been burning up the road. Yes. That's 65 between Mobile and, and Montgomery. So let me ask you what I ask all the candidates. Sure. That's a pretty basic question. Why are you running for Congress? Yeah, so um, right after the Supreme Court, um, you know, affirmed the lower court ruling, mm -hmm. my phone actually started ringing. So this was prior to the maps being drawn and any, and, and any of that. So I'm very active nationally um, with women's groups, um, especially when it comes to women's reproductive justice issues. So folks were like, are you running? And then I had just come back from the White House um, around that particular issue. Me and 48 other legislators were invited uh, for the, the work that we've done about, um, you, know, uh, you know, just ensuring that women have access to abortions if they need to. Mm -hmm. um, so I come back home and my daughter says to me, um, Mom, are you running for Congress? And I said, why, why did you ask me that? And she said, um, she said, well, I was working a um, health fair this weekend and people kept coming up to me and asking me, is your mom running for Congress? So she said, are you running for Congress? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm praying about it. I'm thinking about it. Um, two weeks later, she comes back and asks me the same question. Well, mom, have you made up your mind? Are you running for Congress? And I said, I'm still thinking and praying. And she said, well, mom, if not you, then who? And you got to think about that. That's my daughter. She's 26 now. She knows um, my, my tragedies, my triumphs. She's seen me at my worst times and at my best. And for someone to know everything that there is really to know and to say that you are the one, then I truly had to, in, a, in addition to the phone calls that I had been getting, you know, make that, that serious thought about running. Mm -hmm. And once we thought about it and started, you know, putting the tentacles out, we had an exploratory team um, out through um, prior to um, actually qualifying. And folks were like, hey, look, we, we like you, we support you. And we decided to go ahead and run. And, and we're running on the same types of issues that I've been fighting for uh, and against mm -hmm. um, in the Alabama State Senate and the State House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't have a long time to make up your mind, no. right? It was a pretty short window. <laughs> um, well, you are one of several candidates 
that are running for this seat who actually live outside of the district, yes. in your case, Birmingham. Now, to be perfectly clear, that's absolutely allowed. Exactly. Um, but what would you say to voters who might have a concern about someone living outside the district running? Sure, so actually I actually, I have a rental house here now in the office park area here in, in Montgomery. I thought that was important okay. to have a space here. But no, I'm not indigenous. I have family roots here in the district, but I didn't grow up here. I actually didn't even grow up in Alabama. Um, my, my dad is military and you know, what we're taught is that you actually, uh, you, wherever you, your seeds are planted, that's where you bloom. And mm -hmm. that's been me throughout my tenure in the legislature in life. Um, but it actually doesn't come up as often as you would think. Um, I've had listening sessions throughout Congressional, congressional District 2, um, uh, uh, from the smallest county to, of course, Montgomery and Mobile. And I even asked in Bullock County, I was talking to the Voters League, and I said, well, somebody please ask me, <laughs> you know, the elephant in the room. And the person raised their hand and said, I actually wanted to know, well, can you raise money? Um, what I found in these listening sessions with the citizens of Congressional District 2. They are more concerned about, do you have a record of production? What can you do? Some people have never had the opportunity to meet their member of Congress. And meeting me, potentially they're meeting their member of Congress who is listening to them mm -hmm. about what are the issues that they care about and they're concerned about. So, so it doesn't actually come up as much as you would think. Only politicals bring it up. But again, those folks in the district don't ask me that question. They ask me about my record and what are you gonna do for Congressional District 2? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the district, it's obviously a lot different yeah. than it was. It's really a brand new district uh -huh. uh, than, than the traditional the second district. It's traversing all the way from Phoenix City, Montgomery, down to Mobile, it's yeah. really a, a, a large district. So how do you go about campaigning given those just geographic yeah. challenges. The geographic makeup is actually pretty similar to my current Senate district. People don't realize that even in an urban area, you have areas, I have farmers in my district. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go out to the Nelson farm, they've invited me out there, but you just have to do it. You get in the car, uh, my daughter who uh, has a political science degree, in addition to two masters, a, a MBA and an MPH, she needs a job too, you all gotta hire her. <laughs> um, she has been what they call bodying me, driving me through these various counties. And um, we have had an amazing time meeting these citizens from Mobile to talking specifically, what are the issues that they care about? I thought they would talk to me about the ports and talk to me about Red Snapper. Folks in Mobile were asking about what can you do at the congressional level as it relates to crime? Hmm. I mean, we have a crime issue. What can you do at the federal level? I'm in Monroeville. Um, uh, that has actually was the largest listening session that we held thus far. Very diverse community that came out to that listening session. And of course, their number one issue was the closing of their hospital, the maternity ward specifically. Hmm. There was a woman sitting in that listening session who was pregnant, who said, what if I have an emergency? I mean, so I've been going throughout this district, driving through the district, knocking on doors and talking to folks, and that's the only type of campaigning that I know how to do. That's what I've been doing for 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's what I'll continue to do, is that, that, that human touch, that personal touch in the district. Mm -hmm. Well, you kind of touched on what I was gonna ask you next, and that is, it's such a large field, yeah. even just in the Democratic primary, right? Lots of candidates running, a lot of your colleagues yeah. running, right? So how do you, st I mean, and this is really, it's coming down to a runoff, uh, and you can kind of consider it like a playoff. So what do you do to stand out as yeah. a candidate in this large field so that come March 5th, you are in that top two for that runoff? So I'm a, I'm a woman of faith, so I would believe God to win it outright. And I actually have won a race before when there were six other um, people in the race without a runoff, but the reality of it is more than likely there will be a runoff. Um, so we're creating a movement um, to kind of separate ourselves from everybody else. We have a mantra, um, a rally call in our campaign, and it's called Marching with Marika. People are getting excited about it. It's exciting to me when people post on my page, I'm marching with Marika. Um, we are exciting women throughout uh, Congressional District 2. We're exciting those folks who may not have ever had anybody to talk to them before about what are the issues that they're concerned about. So they've been marching with us. We are rallying together. And if you are interested in marching with Marika also, you can go to marikaforcongress.com, sign up, and we'll be glad to bring you on as a part of our team. So, but, but, but specifically though, because we are running a traditional grassroots campaign, but there is also a science or strategy to campaigning. So when you look at the most likely voters in Congressional District 2, 64% of them are women. 
Um, they are going to determine, women are going to determine who ends up being the member of Congress representing Congressional District 2. So as a woman, of course, I, in the Alabama Senate, I, in the Alabama House of Representatives, I fought for those issues. Women, we, reproductive rights, child care subsidies, other kitchen table issues that not only impact women, but families. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we'll be running on um, as we continue to go throughout this district. So, Marching with Marika. And you got the website in. That was, that was uh, <laughs> you know, well, well done. So and you're we're talking about the primary. Yes. Um, but then if you're successful, it goes to a general election. And this is a purple district. You can say probably Democratic leaning, but as, as purple as we've seen in a long time. And yeah. that means it may take, you know, independent voters, more moderate voters. So it's a challenge, right? You've got to appeal to the you've base. you got to appeal that coalition. Right, that afterwards. base to win the primary. But then you've got to turn around and appeal to maybe independents, more moderate voters. So, you know, how do you do both? Can you do both, appeal to the base, but also some of those independents? You have to. Currently, again, I serve in a super minority um, in the Alabama legislature. There are 140 members only 35 African Americans and only 37 Democrats. And in order to pass any piece of legislation, and I've been very successful passing legislation, you have to build coalitions on both sides of the aisle. Um, now there are some issues that you will never get there on, but on those issues that we can find commonality in, especially those kitchen table economic development issues, jobs, education, we appeal to those folks in the middle when it comes to those commonalities. But I, again, I've, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years now, having to uh, build relationships on both sides of the aisle. Now, what my colleagues will tell you, um, and what, you know, I'm gonna be who I am. You know, I'm not gonna pre pretend to be anybody else. And I think that people respect you when you're very honest with them. Uh, and I think about one particular issue many years ago. Um, I voted against the ban on same-sex marriage many years ago, like 2006. And so I got, I was in an election process that time and I had some folks in a church that said to me, hey, we don't like this vote, we're not gonna support you. I took it, I listened to everything they had to say and then I stood up and I talked to them about the many years that we had worked together on the revenue that I had brought to the district, the projects that I had supported, the type of legislation that we've been able to come together on. And at the end of it, there are folks that say, you know what, I don't like that vote that you've taken, but I respect that you came here, you listened, you took it, and then you reminded us of how we have worked so well together through the years. And so again, yes, I will do just that. But I also believe the Republicans um, are disillusioned about the district. It is 48.9% black voting age population. But this, as 16 out of 17 of the last um, elections, Democrats won those elections. But what I think Republicans are banking on is black voters not going out to vote. Turnout, right. Turnout, not going out. So we're talking about that right now. That's why we're exciting people in the primary to remind them that we, in order to win this race, in order to win it in November, in order for a Democrat to win this race, you've got to go out and vote. So again, that's why we're building that movement of excitement now, preparing people for the November election. Mm -hmm. Well, it's gonna be exciting to watch. It is, it's for, exciting now. For those of us who cover politics for a living, it's really kind of a, a dream, but we'll be following the campaign. Good luck on the campaign trail. Thank you so trail. much, Mar and, uh, MarikaForCongress.com. Please get, get check it us again out. again, that's great. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on Capitol Thank Journal. you so much, glad to be here. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Joining me next is former state Senator Dick Brubaker, Republican candidate for Congress in Alabama's second district. Senator, thanks for coming on Capitol Journal. Todd, thanks for letting me come. Well, we're trying to get to all the candidates, this laundry list of candidates. All 20 of us. <laughs> yeah. In the second <coughs> district race, you're running in the Republican primary. Yep. Uh, pretty crowded field there too, uh, very. Uh, ju just in that primary. So I'll ask the same question I've been asking all the candidates, why are you running for Congress? Well, I'll tell you, when I, last time I ran for the Senate, I said I'd serve two terms and then I'd quit. And I did, I didn't defend my seat. In 2018, I'd served my two terms and I got out. I never thought I'd get back into politics. Mm -hmm. But watching what's going on in this country right now, I'm beginning to believe if we don't turn this around pretty quickly, my grandchildren, maybe even my sons, will live to see this republic fail. 
Well, I think that we have people leading our country that uh, are sowing division to the point where the country's going to become ungovernable. And, and that's on purpose. They want it to happen. And I believe that Republicans, the Republican Party, has become way too fractured, too much, too many circular firing squads where we spend our time shooting each, at each other. And let's just face it, uh, the Republicans, we have a lot of Republicans who have been elected to office but don't seem very serious about governing. I mean, it was Republican infighting is the reason that there was no farm bill passed last year. And, you know, that's just not right. And the country's in trouble, real trouble. And we can talk about why if you, if you want to get into it. But um, as a person with political experience, and, and I, I believe in the legislature, I had a reputation of being able to solve problems, to take a problem-solving approach to govern, governance. I don't think there's anybody in the race with more conservative credentials than I have. And I think I'm the best one to help turn this thing around. Well, I was actually going to ask you about what you've kind of referenced is, you know, Congress is just really dysfunctional. Um, it's been that way for a while, but really over the last couple of years, and especially this last it's year. It's gotten worse, I guess. Absolutely. And some people look at that and say, man, I would, I, that, yeah, that's not for me. I'm not going to be a part of that. But you're running. So do you see it more as a challenge rather than something as a deterrent? Well, I'll be honest with you. I see it as a duty. I mean, one of the things the founders say in our founding documents, that <clears throat> when things go wrong, the people who have the ability uh, to, to run or to do something about it have the obligation to. And, you know, I've got five sons. I've got five grandchildren. I expect to have, you know, more soon. I, I've got other things that I can do with my time. But I love this country, and I can't stand to watch us, uh, to watch it slowly being destroyed. I mean, when I was, let me tell you how far we've, we've slid. And, I, you know, I'm older than you are. When I was 12 years old, my parents used to let me get up in the pitch black dark, and I would ride my bike over to a closed shopping center and roll 112 newspapers for the Advertiser Journal and get on my bike and go deliver those papers. And it never occurred to anybody that somebody would bother a paper boy. But now, no parent in their right mind lets their kids go out of their yard unsupervised because they're just so worried about what might happen to them. You know, that's the America we've lost and the America we've got to get back. Mm -hmm. 400,000, there were 400,000 illegal entries on the southern border last month. That's the size of Pittsburgh. And the democracy cannot survive with that influx of people who are non-citizens and are frankly non-participants. And we've got to get people in government who care about solving those problems. Well, you mentioned illegal immigration. What other key issues do you want to focus on, You know, federal issues that Congress right. can affect? If, you, if elected to Congress. Well, that's why I brought up immigration, because that is a federal issue. Sure. Uh, another one is, you know, we've had inflationary periods in the United States before, but usually most of the trigger was from outside the country, like an OPEC oil embargo or something like that. Well, now we're seeing inflation, especially in the food sector, because of our own government's policies. I mean, look at the energy policy our current leaders are pursuing. They are intentionally driving up fuel costs, which in turn has driven up food costs. In the last year, if you look at the inflation rate of things like butter, sugar, milk, hamburger, uh, eggs are up over 100% since April of 2022. And if you're, you know, I raised five boys, that's a lot of eggs. Things like inflation not only devalue your wages and your savings, they also make it harder on families trying to raise and educate their children. And Congress can do something about inflation by pursuing a more sane energy policy and by beginning to reel in some of this very excessive government spending. And, and until that's done, you know, you're just going to continue to see inflation in areas that are that are sensitive especially to fuel mm -hmm. fuel costs well looking at this race um the district has obviously changed a lot the second district yeah. which i've worked in before it is unrecognizable it's a, it's a, a whole new district really yep and so you are 
pretty well known here in Montgomery, right. not, not just for serving in the state senate, but also uh, your you know car dealerships, car commercials, all that kind of stuff. But take it down to Mobile. You know this district stretches all the way down to Mobile, yes. all the way over to Phoenix City, places you might not be as well known. So I'm how not, do you, yeah. as a candidate, go and campaign in Mobile and and and, and traverse this very large district. Well, everybody in the Republican side that's running has some areas of the state where they are relatively more well known. I may be better known in Montgomery, but Carolyn Dobson is very well known in, you know, Bullitt County area, down in that area of the state. And of course, Greg Albritton is very well known in, in the, some of the uh, so, more southern parts of district too. So everybody's got their area. But when it comes to, like you asked about Mobile, I, you know, I have been spending my time educating myself on what issues, federal issues, that a town like Mobile, where I have never lived, has to contend with. And let's face it, Montgomery is spending a whole lot of money right now building a container port. Mm -hmm. Well, if Mobile doesn't get the money to widen the channel and the containers can't get out of the port city, well, the money we're spending probably isn't going to do us very much good here in Montgomery. So. A lot of the issues seem very central to certain areas. You know, the Farm Bill and the Wiregrass, and uh, and and Mobile does have some very unique issues, mm -hmm. like the fish, like fisheries. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, the big economic driver issues, like widening the port, are going to do people in Montgomery nearly as much good as it'll do people in Mobile. Because, you know, I think the figure I saw, the city spending over $100 million to build this port on the river, and the, and another one further upstream around Jefferson County. And so uh, it's just a matter of familiarizing yourself. Um, I'll tell you another issue that I've learned a lot about since I started this, that the there's been a tide marker on Dauphin Island for 50 years. Uh, the ocean levels are are two feet higher than they were 50 years ago. And most of that increase has happened in the last 10 years. Now this isn't taking the word of some scientists that nobody knows anything about. This is what the people who live there say about the tide marker that they know has been there for 50 years. And because of that, there are areas of Alabama experiencing flooding that haven't ever had to deal with it before. And only the federal government can do that kind of mitigation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's a matter of learning, yeah. and that's what I've been working on doing. Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you this, because because of the district changes, um, it's become a purple district. Yes, very purple. You could even argue it's Democratic leaning. So Yeah, it's you know, D plus four. Yeah, Absolutely it is. Any, any nominee, any Republican nominee to win is probably going to have to appeal to independent voters, maybe some moderate Democrats. So, but you've also got to win the Republican primary right. by appealing to conservatives. So how do you do both? Are you the kind of candidate that can do both, appeal to those conservatives, but also the independents? Well, if I think I'm the best placed among the Republicans to make that claim. I mean, if you look at my legislative record, you know, I will put that up against anybody else that's ever served from this area. The, the work I did on school choice and things that conservatives care about, uh, parental rights, school choice, it's important. But also, I had a reputation of being able to work with people on the other side, whether it's judicial override or, or judicial reform, uh, some of the issues that Quentin Ross and I worked on together. Uh, so I think I can appeal um, to 51% of the voters in the district. Uh, what, uh, and also when it comes to conservative versus liberal, that's not really, I think, the issue that Republicans, we have gotten Republicans in trouble. The problem Republicans have, and a question that every Republican candidate ought to have to answer, are you gonna take money from the Club for Growth and are you gonna join the Freedom Caucus? Hmm. Well, that's a, okay, can you answer oh, it? Oh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. And the reason is what they want for it. The Club for Growth has a rule that if two-thirds of their group votes to take a stand on a certain issue, that they, you're obligated to cast your vote with them. Well, that's one reason we didn't get a farm bill last year. You had Alabama Republicans voting against the direct interest of their district because of commitments they had made to the Freedom Caucus. Now, I may agree with a lot of their stands on certain individual things, but I'm not going to hand them my voting card. Hmm. And the same way with taking money from organizations like Club for Growth. 
Uh, well, I, I, that's actually is going to be a key issue in this race, and I'm interested in how that goes forward. We're out of time, yeah. but uh, good luck on the campaign trail. We'll Thank be you. following it closely. Well, I hope so, and I really appreciate you letting me come on your show. Absolutely. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Alabama's oldest roadway, the old Byler Road in Northwest Alabama, might become the state's newest tourist attraction thanks to the efforts of state and local leaders. Joining me next to talk about it is State Representative Tracy Estes and Joel Mize, local historian and former professor. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Todd, we appreciate the invitation. Well, I'm, I've been eager to talk about this. I've seen the reporting on the Byler Road. We did some of that reporting ourselves, and it's an exciting project, but I wanted to start with you, Representative Estes. Um, I know that you and State Senator Greg Reed have really been drawing the state's attention to this historic project. Tell me how it came about. Well, in fairness, um, Joel Miles brought it to my attention several years ago and um, made me aware of what we were dealing with here. And so I had an opportunity one night, was leaving a function here in Montgomery and ran into Lee Sintel, the Director of Tourism and Travel, and said, I've got a project I think you need to help us with. And so I mentioned it to him and he listened and when I got to the part about it being the first highway in the state of Alabama ever commissioned for construction by the Alabama legislature only days after we became a state in December of 1819, the historian in him, you could see his eyes light up. And he's been a big supporter ever since. So they're helping provide some initial funding for us uh, to start putting up, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, some of the historic markers along the route from the Muscle Shoals area down to Northport, Tuscaloosa area. And uh, so that's how we got things started, was getting tourism to partner with us to help with the funding, and they've been very good about helping promote the project as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, historic tourism is such a big part of what that department does, and Lisa Intel is nobody better. Well, Professor, I would I'd love for you to share with our viewers just more about what the Byler Road is. What are its origins, and, and what is the history of the road? Okay, as uh, Tracy just mentioned, uh, it was authorized uh, two days after statehood. So uh, it's very important in the very earliest days of the state of Alabama. It was a road needed for a couple of reasons. One is Alabama already was getting a reputation for being really great in growing cotton. And cotton was very much in demand, particularly in Europe. And that's where the highest and best price was. But the cotton of the Tennessee Valley was rather landlocked. They couldn't ship the cotton out because of the shoals creating so much turbulence and it was very hazardous for shipping. So consequently, people were looking for ways around the shoals. And thus the Byler Road was seen as a way to ship cotton overland down south to the Warrior River, where the falls of the Warrior River occurred at uh, Tuscaloosa, and consequently the road was built just downstream of the fall line, uh, just where navigation could occur uh, that could take the cotton then onto Mobile and from Mobile onto the foreign ports of, uh, uh, of England and Europe. That's so interesting to think that you know, right after statehood, I mean, one of the first top priorities as, the, as a new state was saying, hey, we've got to figure out this, really an infrastructure project in order to export probably the state's most valuable resource. Yes, uh, uh, that was a very important factor. There was a secondary factor that I would also mention, which is uh, the Jackson Military Road had just been built. Uh, uh, under an authorization that Congress approved where Jackson would use his War of 1812 soldiers in the period of 1816 to 1820 to build the Jackson Military Road, which was a shortcut from Nashville down to the Southwest Territories, which had recently been acquired through the Louisiana Purchase. 
and also New Orleans was a prominent city on the move west as settlers began looking for ways to come across the Alleghenies and the Appalachians and get down to these new territories. They wanted to come down the Jackson Military Road, which had just been built. Well, Alabama uh, political figures got to concerned that people were just going to pass right on through Alabama on their haste to go see those western properties. And we wanted them to stay in Alabama a while, and thus the Byler gave a new avenue to have people linger longer in the state and move from the Shoals area down to Tuscaloosa, where they could get a better, deeper flavor of the opportunities that Alabama offered. Mm -hmm. Well, I know one of the historic finds along this road has been this slave cemetery, a pretty uh, significant slave cemetery right along the road. Talk about that significance, that history, and as promotion efforts begin, that kind of the sensitive nature of that being associated with the road. Well, I think the key word you used there, Todd, was sensitive because we are dealing with with critical state history. It may, it may be history that we're not all very proud of now on, on the back side of it, but at the same time, it is still part of what this state was and, and what we moved through as a people. Um, we serve, I serve in the, in the legislature now with several black colleagues who are friends of mine, and we work very well together. And I'm proud to see how far our state has come in race relations. But you are correct. We, we will have to proceed with caution to make sure that we pay proper respect where it's due because there are hundreds, as I understand, of uh, former slaves and their descendants buried there. But that is a part of our history as people travel the road, as we, we mark it with historic markers. I'm sure there's going to be folks who would like to get off noting its size sure. just to have a chance to visit that and turn back a chapter in the state's history and take a glimpse from where we've come and realize where we are today. Probably some excellent educational opportunities there with a, an actual site. And I understand it's one of the largest slave cemeteries in the country? Yes, a recent uh, uh, survey has been accomplished by the archaeology department of the University of Alabama, where they went in with several uh, levels of subsurface investigation to see what was under the surface there. The th at the time before the project started, the thinking was, there were maybe three to 400 burials in that cemetery. What the surveys uh, revealed is that there were around 850 uh, graves in the central cemetery, and then considering a couple of uh, peripheral cemeteries that were also attached to the central plantation from which these slaves came, there's probably well over a thousand slaves and slave descendants that are buried in this one concentrated location. Goodness. So this is right on Lake Tuscaloosa, and um, it's right on the old Byler Road route. The plantation that uh, spawned these, uh, uh, the concentration of the uh, slavery was one owned by uh, a John Welch Pruitt. So it was known as the Pruitt Plantation back in the early days of the state. And John Welch Pruitt is reported to have had ownership or partial ownership in a steamboat going uh, regularly scheduled routes from Tuscaloosa to Mobile. And it's also told that he had three ocean-going sailing ships sailing out of Mobile Bay. So he had a ready uh, a supply of the, uh, of the, the chain of production to get the production all the way into uh, Europe and England. That kind of almost tells the full scope of the economics there in, involved with, with slavery and cotton and every, everything like that. I want to go back even further in history because I understand that the Byler Road actually has some prehistoric origins. Talk about that. Okay, uh, there, there are actually uh, two classes of prehistoric history that we're covering in our signage project. Uh, one is the one that maybe is most interesting to the audience would be the fact that we have uh, a, a great deal of uh, American Indian history along the trail. From the top of the trail, we've got the Cherokee Indians and other uh, prehistoric uh, archaic Indians that built mounds in the Tennessee River. They built shell mounds with the mussel shells found there. 
so that much of the mussels and the mussel shoals were because that was a great place for nature to grow these shells. The rapids and the fresh water were what those shells thrived on. Then later, you, as you move on down the, the roadway toward Tuscaloosa, on the Tuscaloosa end, you've got the Black Warrior himself, uh, Chief uh, Tuscaloosa. Uh, so you got that part of the Indian story. And another part we've discovered in digging deeper into the history here is that uh, there was a east-west uh, early trading path that was recorded in history as early as 1696 and another trip in 1698 traveled from Charleston, South Carolina over to trade with the Chickasaw Indians around Tupelo, Mississippi and also the Quapaw Indians of Arkansas. So back in the early 1600s, the very first known English trader who came into the territory of what's now Alabama came along this Chemin de la Caroline. That was the Trail of the Carolinas that was an Indian trading path which the Cherokee, I mean the Chickasaws used first to go all the way to Carolinas to trade and then later the uh, tradesmen on the Carolina coast decided it's time for them to go, go in and begin direct negotiation at the village level. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to ask you about the involvement of the University of Alabama Center for Economic Development. I understand that they've been very involved oh, in seeing the opportunities here. They've been fantastic. Nisa Miranda was the director at the time, and, and she is still involved on the periphery of this project. She has since retired. Brian Rushing has now taken over Point, and the university had, has been a godsend for us and what we're trying to do with this project, with the services they've provided. Uh, there's a group of five or six of us that hold meetings on a regular basis trying to make sure we're staying on schedule of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so I, I really want to thank Nisa in the early stages. I want to thank Brian Rushing for what he's doing and taking the lead for the Center for Economic Development now. And, and let's be honest, sometimes whether it's Alabama or Auburn, having one of those logo brands out there associated with your project is never a bad thing when it comes to maintaining yeah. and gaining credibility. I'd also be amiss if I did not mention a gentleman by the name of Skip Tucker. He's a former journalist, used to be editor of the Daily Mountain Eagle in Jasper. He's helped on several gubernatorial campaigns in our state's history. And so he is also a wealth of knowledge in a little bit different area than Joel is. And he is our public relations manager for this project. Yeah. And so he's been fantastic to take point. Um, but my journalism background, there's a part of me that was tempted to want to do that. And I thought, no, we've got too much to do in the legislature. So Skip has stepped up and done a phenomenal job working with us in maintaining that contact between the university and the Department of Tourism. And it's really, really been a great partnership. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Probably wouldn't be sitting here without Skip. Um, one last thing. You talk about tourism, and I know it's early in the project, but what are some of the early ideas you see? You talked about signage, about how the tourism department can work maybe with local partners to identify the right types of stops along the way and really um, you know, get the word out about this project. Well, the good thing is Joel has done so much homework with his book and all of his other uh, studies over the years as far as picking those sites. That work's been done and just given to us, laid in our hands due to his previous efforts. Um, we're going to try to do around 50 signs, bronze markers, over the first three years. And the okay. Department of Tourism has set aside the money to help cover that cost. We're going to do around 16 or 17 a year for those three years. And we'll probably have to come back and dip in again as long as tourism is willing to help us and extend it beyond the three years to get where we eventually want to go because there is so much history along this trail. Uh, we would love to eventually hear people talk about the Byler uh, Road in the same breath with the Natchez Trace, something along that line, that it would become almost common nomenclature that people would want to come to Alabama and, and visit to see this part of our history because it is the earliest part of Alabama history under statehood. And I think it's interesting, going back to some things Joel mentioned earlier about trying to keep folks in the state of Alabama, that shows the legislature over 200 years ago was battling some of the same issues we battle today. <laughs> we want to keep that tourism dollar in the state. So and some infrastructure. Things have, infrastructure, <laughs> infrastructure and tourism dollars. So some things never change, even as the centuries pass. We do have a vision for expanding beyond the historical. Uh, one of the kinds of things that we're uh, looking at is partnering with the uh, Sweet uh, Trails Alabama, 
mm -hmm. that are looking at a trail network of walking, outdoor recreation, biking, hiking, etc. cetera. Uh, and we have something on the order of as many as 30 trails, uh, existing trails that we'll be crossing with the Byler Road route uh, and or new trails that can be developed off of some of the country roads, if you will, that were formerly Old Byler Road, but today are simply isolated uh, segments of county roads. Mm -hmm. Some of them still in the gravel state, some of them have been paved, but nevertheless, there's a wealth of outdoor recreation trails that we anticipate will develop uh, from the Byler Road project. Yeah, I tell you what, that's um, outdoor rec recreation is becoming the name of the game, even in economic development. Well, look, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for coming on here and sharing with us about the Byler Road project. We're going to be following up because I really think this is an important project uh, for our history and so educational, so many educational opportunities. So thanks again for coming on Capital Journal. Look forward to catching up soon. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Capital Journal will be back next week when my colleague Randy Scott will host the show. That's at the same time right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.